Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the fourth of our series here, Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity, sponsored by the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. I'm Aristotle Pepe Nicolau. I hold the, um, the Harris, the Archbishop Demetrius Chair in Orthodox uh, Theology and Culture, which of course was sponsored generously by the Jaharis Family Foundation. And together with my colleague, George Demacopoulos, we co-direct the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. Please come visit us at our website, fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. Visit also our, uh, our electronic publication, publicorthodoxy.org. And uh, both on Public Orthodoxy and our website, you'll see a great deal of content, including, uh, including a recording of this particular conversation, which I'm excited to host as well as the previous uh, conversations that we've had in this series, as well as other content as well. So I'm very, very excited to have my friend, uh, co-collaborator, very much involved in our center, Vera Shevzov from Smith College. Vera, welcome. Very nice to Thank have you. you. Thanks for I having thought, me. Before I introduce you, I thought maybe I'd try something different. I'm not sure if it's gonna work, but you know, you know, our, you know our, our, our mutual friend, Sister Vasa, you know, she has that coffee with Sister Vasa. I don't know whether it works, whether we should uh, maybe change the format a little bit and have wine at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. Do you have any wine in your office there? Maybe you could break it. Well, you know, I always drink from a, you know, a cup. You can't tell <laughs> what's in there. So <laughs> it may be wine, it may be not. That's a good way. I would be glad to toast. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is better at, at happy hour. I don't know. Maybe I'm scandalizing. Yes. Uh, people, but that wouldn't be the first time our center scandalizes people, of course, but uh, maybe this is better at happy hour. Maybe it's not better. Maybe it's better at, not at all because Sister Vasa's program is so wonderful and I encourage all the people who are uh, following us today to really kind of um, look for her programming and her content and to support her work. Uh, so, you know, her, her interviews are so wonderful. So maybe she's onto something by just sticking with coffee. Um, she does these wonderful um, daily emails that I, I kind of read, um, uh, you know, uh, every day. And she just sort of really keeps it short and simple and they're really quite helpful. So anyway, we've, uh, in many ways, this webinar takes inspiration from the great work that she does, but we're here to talk about your great work. And so now let me, before we get into the questions, let me uh, introduce you here. So I, of course, uh, I, there's all kinds of wonderful things I can say off the top of my head but it's probably better if I sort of read here a few uh, details from your bio, right? So you are professor of religion in the religion department and director of the program in Russian, East European and Eurasian studies at Smith College, where you've been teaching for 25 years. And you did your undergraduate and your doctoral work at Yale University. And of course you studied under Yaroslav Pelikan, but we'll talk about that a little bit later, what it was like to study under him. But you also did your Master's of Divinity, which is a ministry degree, mm -hmm. at St. Vladimir's Seminary, under, an, under, under, under another great scholar of Orthodox Christianity, Father John Meindorf. And of course, George, my colleague, holds the Father John Meindorf and Patterson Family Chair in Orthodox Christian Studies. And of course, just to remind everybody, Father Meindorf was a full professor at Fordham University while he was dean at St. Vladimir's. And in many ways, uh, what we do here at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center um, could not really be done uh, without him paving the way uh, for having that presence at Fordham University. And we're grateful for Fordham for the way they've supported this dialogue with uh, Orthodox Christianity. So, um, but also very interestingly, you have such an interesting sort of, um, all these interesting places of study that you've been to, kind of a mix here. You've studied at Leningrad State University and Leningrad Theological Academy, which is now St. Petersburg University and St. Petersburg Theological Academy. So we'll talk about that too, what that was like. You have been the recipient of numerous grants, very prestigious National Endowment for the Humanities, the, Academy, the American Academy of Religion, Social Science Research Council, and the Mellon Foundation, the International Research and Exchange Board, among others. And you have numerous publications that have spanned a variety of topics from Orthodox Christianity and modern and post-Soviet Russia. And of course, this wonderful monograph, which I've read, right? See everybody here, Oxford University Press. This monograph is Russian Orthodoxy on the Eve of Revolution. And you won, uh, the book itself won an award, the Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize from the American Society of Church History, right? 
but you also have other uh, publications that kind of show the breadth of your interests, um, uh, the various kinds of interests you have as a scholar of Orthodox Christianity. So just, I'm just going to name a few because you're, you know, the list of publications is so long, but I'm just going to name a few. So uh, burden of, so an article called Burden of Tradition, the Orthodox Construction of the West in the late 19th and early 20th century Russia. Uh, another article, Thoughts from Orthodoxy's Modern Past, Theology, Religion, and University in Russia. Another one, Resistance and Accommodation, the Right of Orthodoxy in Modern Russia, which examined the debates over the recitation of anathemas on the Sunday of Orthodoxy in Modern Russia. So quite, a, quite an eclectic mix there, right? Just a few more, I think, uh, highlights here of, of great notes. I mean, you and I together were uh, co-chairs on the steering committee of the Eastern Orthodox Christian Studies Group at the American Academy of Religion, which is uh, really a wonderful place for discussion uh, and has really grown over the past 20 years or so. But you're also co-chair of the steering committee of the Slav on Slavic Orthodoxy for the recently established International Orthodox Theological Association, which had its uh, first meeting in uh, well, last year and Yash, and founded by our friend and great scholar as well, uh, Paul Garvey Look, who is the founder and president. And you're an advisory, you're, you're very much involved in our center. Um, oh, before I mention our center, uh, you're also on the International Planning Committee of the Oslo, Oslo Coalition on Freedom and Religion or Belief for projects related specifically to Orthodox Christianity. And of course, you're very involved in our center, you're on, on our advisory council, you co-edit with George, uh, the Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies, which has uh, been newly launched and it'd be wonderful to hear uh, what your experiences have been that. And of course, you're part of our uh, three-year, or well, our multi-year Loose, uh, Loose Foundation, Henry Loose Foundation and Leadership 100 uh, sponsored uh, project on orthodoxy and human rights, right? So you've been very active, very much in the mix of things. And really uh, ever since, uh, you know, ever since, your birth, really. I mean, and, and that'll kind of be the first question. So <laughs> right? Ever before since get, my birth. <laughs> right. So before I get to that question, before I get to that question, just to remind everybody, we'd love to field your questions. And please use uh, the chat function has been disabled, uh, but you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And uh, to kind of give us your questions and towards the end here, uh, we'll talk with Vera a little bit and towards the end, we'll be able to kind of field all the questions that you have. So let's begin with an easy one, or maybe the hardest one. I don't know. Yes, I think it's going to be the hardest hard. one, right? So can you tell us just a little bit about your life growing up and how it influenced your career path and scholarly, uh, scholarly oh, uh, maybe a Freudian slip there, scholarly traje trajectory. Right. And the fact that, as you always say, that my father was a priest, right? So that... Um, uh, I think that is the most difficult question because it's so complicated. Uh, family, uh, family histories are always complicated and they do, I think, affect people's career choices often in, in unexpected ways. Um, the fact that my father was first a deacon and then a priest growing up, of course, had an impact on um, my uh, trajectory, but I wouldn't say that, that, that he in and of himself was necessarily uh, a pivotal inspiration for choice I made. In fact, I think he had wanted me to become a chemist or a biologist or enter the STEM fields. He was himself a chemist by profession, even he was a priest and he saw this beauty between science and religion and this harmony. Uh, and so for him, uh, I, was, I think he was surprised by the path I actually ended up taking. Um, in any case, I was born into a uh, diverse emigre Russian family, uh, and both sets of grandparents emigrated during the Civil War uh, in the 1920s, but this family was very, very different. It was very diverse, and they would not have met had it not been for the revolution, obviously, in the Civil War. Uh, one side of the family, my mother's side, my grandfather was an old believer. I don't know if viewers know uh, but who will believe the group of old believers that were part of um, a product of a schism in the Orthodox Church in Russia in the 17th century. But they were a unique group in Russia in the sense that they had been persecuted, uh, in, especially in the 18th century, and then uh, continued to be periodically marginalized. And, and uh, um, uh, even though they were uh, great, they had, you know, great, some great statesmen and people that uh, I think people who are watching, maybe watching this webinar, 
uh, would know some of these names, like the person, uh, the Tretyakov Gallery. Mr. Tretyakov was an old believer, right? So uh, uh, they were very prevalent in society, but nevertheless, they were marginalized and they certainly were not, um, uh, I can't say my grandfather or many old believers were, uh, uh, how would you say, supporters of the Tsar, let's say, let's put it that way, right? the Tsar's regime. Um, my paternal grand, um, my uh, paternal grandparents, uh, one was from Moscow and they were from a, also an interesting family that they, uh, it was my paternal grandmother. She was from a line of clergy in Moscow that then in the end, in, in the mid 19th century left the clergy. There was this trend when uh, sons of clergymen began to leave and they left and became, a lot of them became doctors. So her father was a doctor. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then my paternal grandfather was also in business uh, as was the old believer grandfather. So this, these are businessmen. Um, and they, you know, actually, I don't know if I should say this, but the paternal grandfather, they had a, uh, they had a, a mill business, you know, they did a, like wheat and they had like a vodka factory and they had you know, like the chefs off vodka. <laughs> <laughs> this actually, <laughs> but we won't go there. Uh, but this was, this. There's no, there's no chefs off vodka in your fridge over there? Or? No, none here. But I remember when he visited Russia, he brought back a bottle because apparently even in the Soviet times, even though it was all confiscated, of course, I think that they kept that name. I bought, I have to, I have to look at my mother's house. My father's passed away, so I don't know. But in any case, it, we didn't really talk about that much. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, but that, that grandfather left the business and went to Moscow to become a lawyer. Short point is in the Civil War, everything blew up and they ended up emigrating and one, my grandfather was the old believer, ended up in Prague. The other ended as many, up- As many of them did, right? I mean, they went to, many, many went to Prague, right? Uh, many emigres went to Prague. That was one center. There was, you know, there was Berlin, Paris, Prague, Belgrade. There was many centers and uh, mine were in Prague and then the other side were in Belgrade. And how they all came to America, you know, is also very complicated, interesting stories. But the point is they came to America. Uh, they had stayed in Europe for a while thinking that this was going to be temporary and they were going to go home. Uh, but when they realized they weren't going anywhere, you know, um, they emigrated to America. And um, uh, uh, so the stories, uh, I grew up in America um, uh, uh, you know, in a very normal, which you would say average, a New England town, uh, Southbury, Middlebury, Connecticut, if people know that area, you know, I went to public high schools, I played field hockey, I, uh, you know, very active in school, I, you know, this public life was, was, you wouldn't know anything was, you know, I was just American, right? But then I had this other, other life, you know, this other world. Um, and it was this other world that was very, very powerful in terms of its formative uh, uh, role, I'd have to say. Um, and, you know, just this little kinds of stories. And I'll, can I just mention two examples? Course, to show, yeah. yeah, to show the complexity of, of how, how this world uh, that was, you know, this diverse world, you know, this, this, you know, or I think you would understand this too, and where people who are raised in Orthodox families know it's a very complex world. It's not uniform at all. Uh, and, um, and it's also intertwined with culture as well. It's not just a Sunday thing, right? Orthodoxy is not, was never just a Sunday thing for us, I have to say. So in any case, um, we, uh, uh, because my grandfather was an old believer, you know, they didn't go to church. They had a, a, a chapel at home, a prayer room at home, and they had a priest because there are very few Orthodox uh, old believer priests that had made it abroad. And uh, they had a, one lived in their area for a while, left them with the, you know, with, with everything they needed, but they just had reader services. And uh, I remember telling this story to some to uh, friends at St. Vladimir's when I was there, because um, I said, well, the, how did they do, how did they have communion? And I said, just totally, you know, we were eating dinner, and I said, well, they got it in the mail a couple times a year, 
<laughs> like they're gonna just die. <laughs> they're just like well, got their very, communion in the mail. It's really relevant yeah. considering all the debates about how communion is distributed and everything. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, no big deal, you know. No one's, I, no, one's really, never, no one's really come up with that one in COVID nineteen, I guess. Right, it was in a capsule. <laughs> I guess it was someone put in a capsule and mailed to them from Australia. I mean, what can I say? Um, yeah. Right? So um, it was very interesting, but again, something that I hadn't thought was, you know, grew up with that. What's so weird about that? That's a great right? thing. And then, and then, but my father as a deacon and, you know, his side of the family was very religious, you know, sang choirs and everything and became, I said, so he went, and so as a family, uh, our core family, my brother, my mother, my father and I would go to vigil always Saturday together, but on Sundays we were split. Right. So who some stayed at home to pray with my grandparents, the old believers, and some and my father always went to church, but we were free to, you know, we wanted to church with him or stay there or whatever. Um, uh, and that was until my grandfather passed away. Once he passed away, that um that that sort of um we all just started going to church. But the point is is that there was this diversity. And I think this is a really important point. The diversity is in orthodoxy was implanted in me from the beginning. That you you lived it in a way. You were living right, and 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 and, and, th and this is why you know going to other Orthodox churches, there was never this kind of you know that it, it just was so foreign to me to think it all had to be the same. Same. There's not wasn't this homogeneity that somehow. No, absolutely not. And and if anything, I, I sort of I sort of revel in in this diversity of it all, right? Yeah. In any case, uh, the second very quick story I'll tell. And the other questions aren't as interesting, frankly, that we're going to be talking about is much more interesting. Uh, was right in this town that I grew up in was this little place called, uh, it's a, a national heritage site now, and it's called uh, Russian Village. Uh, and it sounds weird to have in South Burnett, Connecticut, this place called Russian Village. I remember thinking when I was small, um, like, this is weird. Why would they have this road here called Russian Village? Well, you so, find um, unexpected places. You know, there's a wonderful right. Russian icons here in Concord, Massachusetts, which people should. Oh, uh, yeah, and um, right, and uh, it is a wonderful place, by the way. Um, but in any case, so um, and this uh, Russian Village had three roads. Russian Village Road was the main street, and then you had Kiev Drive, and then you had Tolstoy Lane. Uh, what in the 1920s? It was actually an artist's. Uh, it was. Uh, started by the son of Leo Tolstoy, who, who emigrated in the early 20s, and he had wanted to start an artist colony so if people who worked and lived in New York could come there for the summers, you know, as a place to think and relax and be together and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how long that lasted, because uh, uh, by the time I grew up, that, had, that, that, was, that generation had already passed. But in any case, what I do remember was at the center of this artist's colony basically was this amazing chapel mm. and it was it was actually the architect for it was um if anyone knows uh, russian art nikolai Roerich, and mm. he's actually known for theosophy mm -hmm. mysticism and spiritualism and, and yoga and uh, i think he actually I'm a, I'm a, oh, yoga. <laughs> we won't go to yoga but uh the point is is that you should look up this chapel it's absolutely beautiful and yeah, so, yeah. You know, in the summers, especially, they would have services there and then these communal meals afterwards. And this was just, again, something that was part of, of, of my life growing up. Um, and again, I raised these and I just this is the point I'm really trying to make is um, several years ago, I read this article by a professor of, of, of language literacy and um, multiculturalism, Sonia Nieto. And, and I'm just going to quote it here because she described um, the dilemma that children of immigrants experience growing up by yeah. virtue of the fact that of the circumstances in which they're born and raised, their lives straddle a here and a there. Mm -hmm. So they're caught between these worlds. And she notes that these questions of belonging mm -hmm. that these, the straddling really raises for young children. Um, she says it can be exacerbated in, in public schools because, um, uh, you know, you're reading a, a textbook on history of America and you don't find right. 
right? Yeah, you don't find anything. About Either that. you find, a, a, you know, a couple of sentences on your cultural group, and then you don't recognize yourself in that cultural group the way it's described, or even worse, it's invisible. Right. You're not there. You don't exist, and yet you live in America, right? And I think that this was. Um, I think that this, uh, you know, her description of this was was very liberating for me in a sense because it showed that this is a, you know, quite a, a common trait. So in any case, it was really these kinds of, of, of dilemmas. I actually wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up, but it was the persistent questions, right. this um, being raised in this environment, that there was just too many questions about a past that really wasn't discussed very much, but was heavily present right. uh, and about an orthodox worldview that I needed to understand uh, and I you know increasingly felt compelled to find answers I needed to I needed to learn I needed to know what happened why it happened and why was or how on earth did orthodoxy get caught up in all of this that's really what it was it was kind of a, and rather than it just being your father uh, being a priest, it was really uh, this kind of embodied sense of in-betweenness that you felt as a result of a kind of saturation, really, of a kind of Russianness, perhaps that included orthodoxy, but wasn't necessarily limited to it, but yet you right. felt all kind of of a piece, kind of. Together. Right. Mm -hmm. However, however, when you could, this is what I wanted to say, that while my father wasn't the catalyst for it, he was the one that provided the tools mm -hmm. uh, and the, um, how would you say, uh, the worldview that allowed me and I think gave me the skills to become, for example, in a, a, a professor in the religious studies department, for example, um, and I'll put this in academic terms, not necessarily in orthodox terms, but I think everyone will understand what I'm saying. Uh, first of all, there was a, uh, and I'm sure you understand this, there was a comfort level around clergy. I never felt very intimidated by clergy. I could be, feel intimidated by a person, right. but I would never, clergy, they were like my father. And so I felt very comfortable and sometimes probably not to my benefit, you know, saying things and arguing things and well, because my father and I argued, and so why can't I argue with this other priest and this bishop and say what I think, right? I mean, this is just the way it happened. And it was, it was very refreshing. You know, the, all the priests and bishops that I happened to know growing up were very, were very, um, were very kind and, and, and open to these kinds of things. Yeah. In any case, there was, um, uh, and so that was one thing, and that was very helpful. So when I, you know, got into studying these things, I could easily maneuver in that world and knew that world from the inside. Yeah. Secondly of all, he gave me a deep um, understanding of the sacred, right? That there, that, you know, what is, you know, this notion of the holy, of the sacred, of, of, um, of uh, uh, and that, you know, faith is something that is both deeply, deeply personal Right and experiential, and it and it, it you know it challenges even our understandings of knowledge. Yeah. Perhaps right. Um, it can problematize that, and you know, in orthodox, its whole attention to the mind and the intellect, um, and yet it's also very much close to community. Right. It's inseparable from community and community bonds. Yeah. Um, it's also tied to beliefs and teachings and stories that you know shape the way we look at the world. And this really helped me to understand other people's sacred worldviews. You know what I'm saying? Is when, you, when, when I entered into the academic world, it was precisely these skills that I got from my father that I really uh, uh, very much um, uh, appreciated. Uh, and, you know, of course, love of liturgy and ritual that comes as part of all of this and to understand that a lot of times that knowledge and experience comes not from reading but from experiencing precisely knowledge, the ritual knowledge is a very different kind of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Important kind of knowledge. Right. Um, and then of course the whole, um, you know, how to live uh, that comes with an entire orth uh, either an orthodox worldview or any sacred uh, worldview. So it's these really ways of thinking, ways of being, ways of understanding 
uh, the world. And, you know, thinking about these ultimate questions, I think, is what came uh, from him. But I do have to say um, that if it comes to the art of prayer, and, um, you know, my father was a priest, and he was a very, as I say, he was a man of great faith. But when it comes to the art of prayer, it was my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, mothers, and now with my current project, you know, a lot of priests are being canonized, you know, as martyrs, but where are the wives? <laughs> you know, what happened to those wives and what did they experience? Yeah. So yeah. I think that the priest's wives are, are incredible and often invisible. Right. I, I agree with that. You know, just to close this, uh, um, you know, close um, uh, out a little bit on this thing on sort of living in between. I mean, I, I, I assume you, I mean, you've been to Russia many times and I assume you've been to sort of the places, let's say, that where your family is from, perhaps uh, the, the buildings or perhaps the, uh, the villages or, or wherever. I mean, how was that for you? Because I know that when I visit my fam my I visited my father's uh, village about 30 years ago. I'm sorry. Yeah. I visited my father's village about 30 years ago. And uh, I remember um, right on the outskirts of the village, you know, uh, my aunt got out of the car to say goodbye to me and she was going to walk back. And I turned and looked at the village and I had a very strong emotional reaction to it, which it was totally unexpected. And I felt like there was something about the ground and the earth or just something. And it reminds me of that that scene uh, in, uh, it's a little bit different, but in Brothers Karamazov, where Alyosha just kind of just collapses to the ground. Um, did, did, did you, when going back for the first time, did you have sort of experiences yes, like Yes, absolutely. <laughs> of course, you know, um, other, you know, I mean, I could have anecdotes from that. Absolutely. And I, you know, I once, I, I met this woman who was a, um, uh, she was uh, a translator. Uh, she was a Russian emigre as well, but she had been a translator for our State Department and in very high uh, circles. And she once told me um, uh, that the first time she went to Russia with a delegation, when she saw a bread store, you know, and with the Russian word bulichle, right? And she burst into tears. <laughs> and it was because there, it was just this emotional kind of uh, yeah. thing, you know, and, and um, you know, and yeah. Now, other people would tease me, you know, friends would tease me, oh, so you're going to this land where, you know, uh, you're breathing the air that, you know, St. Seraphim breathed or Dmitry Donskoy breathed or something. <laughs> I'm quite sure the air there is the same, but... Um, well, it, says, uh, it says something about, you know, the, something that you study very intently, which is about icons, but before we get to the icon question, or maybe we can sort of, maybe you can uh, uh, have one question sort of lead and segue into the other, but just tell us then more and more concretely a little about your graduate studies, you know, like, well, yeah, I mean, I think how, once that, I just, how that took yeah. shape, uh, the people you studied with, what it was like studying with, you know, certain people, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think, um, once I decided that this is what I was going to do, uh, I, I needed time to decide what path to go. Was it going to be history? Was it going to be really studies? I mean, how was I going to do this? Right. Theology. Uh, what? Theology. <laughs> theology, right. Well, I, I actually never considered theology, but I did consider history or religious studies because, again, um, I don't know why, actually. I guess it was sort of like, I, I thought of literature, but I just wasn't good at it, right? It just wasn't my thing. I wasn't either, yeah. Uh, so, uh, in any case, I went to, um, I took a year off after graduate uh, after undergrad, uh, and I went back to Russia. I studied for a semester, and this was all during Soviet times, still, you have to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I went back uh, and studied in Leningrad uh, in, um, University, uh, contemporary Soviet writers, of all things, and which was very interesting. Yeah, that was uh, a fascinating experience. Well, it actually was, because um, first of all, again, their two worlds were not um, here and there. It was more now and then, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was a now and the time before. Mm -hmm. um, but it was then that I got to travel around Russia with friends that I had known, you know, friends who were Orthodox, and I got to see a lot of Orthodox communities and uh, visited places. And uh, that's when I knew, um, 
uh, what I had to do next. And the next step had to be if I was going on this path, and this is what I always warn my grad my students at Smith about when they want to go, they talk to me about going into graduate school. After my own experience, you know, if you want to do it right, it's a long path. Yeah, it is. Path. <laughs> uh, it's a lifelong path in many ways, but still just the training part of it can take a long, long time. So it has to be almost something you, you can't see yourself doing anything else, right? It's all you can do. Uh, and so I had, uh, the first thing I had to do was learn about orthodoxy. I mean, I had to, I had to really immerse myself and not Russian orthodoxy, but in orthodoxy, the orthodox world, you know, I had to knew, know that I didn't know it from the beginning to the end. I had to know dogmatics. I had to know patristics. I had to know um, liturgics. And so I looked around for secular universities, right? Uh, that I would have a graduate program in something like this, a master's program somewhere. And of course, as you know, in those years, forget it. I mean, there was nothing. And so I talked to some scholars and they said, no, you should definitely go to St. Vladimir's. And I wasn't sure because, you know, I thought, you know, that they're training for the priesthood and this and that. And I, you know, not what I was, I, I wanted to preparing for graduate school. And they said, no, 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 uh, you should go there. So I went and it was amazing. It was like magic. Father Mayendor knew exactly what I was doing and was, came to the right place. He was a great guy. He was a great guy and he was a, a generous. He was so supportive. And, was, and funny. And people don't realize how funny. He was hilarious. He was definitely hilarious. I know. Um, and um, he, he was perfect. And you know, he would, he would do special studies with me on, on, on various topics. And he's the one that alerted me to these academic theologians that I keep, um, you know, um, bothering all of you guys about that we should know more about it. Was, he was the one that told me about them and said, you have to learn this because this is really where the scene was, you know, and these, these journals and these articles that they published. In any case, so, um, and Father uh, Alexander Schmemann, that was his, he passed away the, 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 my first semester there, but still I had half of a semester with him. He taught liturgic, so, and, that, and that was very special. I'll never forget that um, either. Just being around these people, you know, was, is so, um, it was an amazing place, I have to say at that time, um, that I knew. Um, and uh, so I, learned so much and it it was so helpful that experience for graduate work because then when i got to graduate school i hit the ground running yeah. um, because i knew all that already and so you know at yale uh, Den uh dino genicopolis was the really right. I remember that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh-huh and so i remember starting to sit in app and in his courses after i had gone to uh, St. Vladimir's, and I really didn't need to because it was all, I had already had all that. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, he, was a, he was a great teacher. Um, uh, but instead, what I needed was not only courses in Russian history, but I realized that if I was going to really understand Russian thought, I needed to know European thought. So I started taking courses in, uh, at the Div School and in and Western Christian thought and, and, and theology and had, you know, really good professor there, Hans Fry, George Limbeck. I mean, these were classics at the time. And, um, but then my advisors, uh, you know, they, they, advisors look for not topics that you're really interested in. They look at topics that are marketable. And what goes, what, in many ways, they look forward to a job market that you would then have to face. And my advisor was, of course, Yaroslav Pelikan, and another advisor there, right, who's still there, uh, Paul Bushkovich. I worked together with them. And they both uh, thought that this, especially Paul Bushkovich, really thought that, you know, that that's going to be a tough sell at a university to get a job with that topic, um, with the academic theologians, right? So I am. Um, at that time, there was a real cultural turn in historical studies where people started uh, um, uh, looking through archives for the, for the voices of the people, right? Uh, so institutional histories, the traditional kinds of histories of institutions and, and of, of, you know, the um, voices of the elites, right? That it started morphing into hearing the voices of the common people. Right. And, and because these people, you know, 
people shape history. It's not just these few. So, um, and I was influenced by that a lot. I, uh, my uh, minor field is Reformation studies in the, the Reformation. Uh, I, I uh, you know, studied with a Reformationist at, at um, Yale that really, really inspired me into that direction. So that's how I really got on to lived religion, right? Yeah. Uh, and studying went from, you know, more of a thought world to a lived world. Well, you were, in many ways, you were kind of at the cutting edge because, you know, we trained roughly around the same time. And I, you know, I always kind of, you know, uh, didn't, I, I, when I did my training, I always had the idea that somehow I was still sort of in the thought world where ideas were the only things that mattered. So we studied, you know, uh, pe the theologians who ultimately shaped and somehow that ultimately shaped either the Byzantine period or the Russian period or something like that. But you're kind of were you know, you were kind of heading, you know, you know, really kind of uh, all the way, you know, you're, you wanted to be on the ground, so to speak. You wanted to see what was happening yeah. on the ground. And, and especially when you have your ultimate goal or your ultimate idea is revolution, you're right. wondering and a state that then becomes, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, officially an atheist state and, uh, and uh, scientific atheism becomes the ruling kind of dominant um, uh, uh, ideology, you know, you're wondering, well, what was going on at the ground? I mean, who's oh, everybody, is that life? me or is it your, uh, what? Uh, uh, I think we, someone froze. It was either me or you. I can't remember. I can't, I couldn't tell, but you're back. You're back. I'm back. We're both back. Okay. All right. So we're both um, back. But, but this thing about um, your research, I mean, this just wanting to be on the ground, right? Um, that permeates. So I read, you know, your book and are many articles and uh, that sort of permeates all your work and uh, and especially um, you know that you've done a lot of work on icons and uh, not necessarily sort of a history of icons but really as lived objects and I, re I remember uh, so when we were together in Finland a few years back and I remember in the, Ru the great Russian cathedral when we were hosted of course by the wonderful bishop there Metropolitan Ambrosius who's since retired and so uh, a very inspiring hierarch and uh, and he was doing liturgy and we were in the Russian cathedral and there was this wonderful, uh, fairly medium sized icon with a bunch of little icons of the Virgin Mary. And I looked at it and I was like, I was confused. I'm like, well, how can there be so many icons of the Virgin Mary and, uh, and child, of course. Uh, and, and then you came right up and just, I remember this clearly, you like recognized practically all of them. And each of them had a story and it wasn't just, a theology from uh, on top trying to impose itself, but basically all these various kinds of, you know, minute permutations of the, of the Virgin icon basically tell on the ground stories, right? And you have a chapter, right. you have a chapter in your book on yeah, icons. Yeah, yeah, and I write a lot, I wrote, wrote a lot about right? this, yeah. Well, tell us a little it, bit about that, yeah. Well, well, the reason why it's interesting, I think, is because, uh, but why it drew my attention especially, um, and um, and tell her, just remind me to come back to the study of Leningrad Theological Academy. I just wanted to tell you. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, actually, we should hear more about that, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to tell you a story from there. Uh, but in any case, we, um, the reason I, I found that, that aspect of my research so interesting was reading these letters from these par very remote parishes written by peasants, you know, and uh, usually, but not always. It was from people from all classes again. Uh, and it was about stories to do with their icons. And usually, you know, a story began, began in a very some a personal experience someone had with, between, from prayer before an icon, right? And that person was either healed or there was something changed in their lives. And then this, and, and usually these icons were of Mary. They, they weren't always of Mary, but often they were of Mary. And I think that's understandable because Mary was the um, person to whom uh, people turn to, I think, at least in Russia, most uh, in prayer because of her, um, it's actually it's a story that comes from the Dormition, you know, those Dormition, the early Dormition stories where she says, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the words exactly, but it's the idea that um, you know, whatever the, a master, you know, she asks, you know, Christ, and whatever is asked of me, can you please grant it, right? So she takes on this mediator role uh, in, in, um, in, um, in sort of a, before Christ, right, as a mother. Yes, so it was really as a mother, this kind of mother figure. So in any case, um, I began reading these letters, 
And these stories, you know, they, they became attached to these icons and then slowly the veneration of these icons would grow. And it wasn't because, again, it wasn't the object itself, but it was that prayer before this particular image. It was as if Mary had shown herself present um, in this image. So when it was ha happened with a personal experience and people found out about it, they celebrated it as if it happened among all of them, right, in these small communities. And so, and then, you know, another town would find out about it and they would invite this icon to come visit them in order to commemorate something that happened in their town. And they became these memory sites, basically. And if you can understand, if you, if you have um, uh, a time when there are no local histories being written, it's these icons, in fact, that become really carriers of memory, right? Of local histories and of memories. And so a person would be standing before an icon they would often not even realize, right, that they were in fact participating in sort of the ongoing uh, uh, a life of this image, right? Um, and, and the and, place, the, I mean, the place in which it's kind of uh, located, or which it's right, or from which right, and it, but, 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 but they moved around. That's what was so interesting, because people were always asking them, so you had hundreds of these icons constantly visiting other towns and places and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but this was not a phenomenon. And, and again, this was not something that was promoted by the church, by the institutional church, I should say. This was the church, but it wasn't, you know, it, it was um, uh, Peter, during the reign of Peter the Great in particular, um, it was sort of an embarrassment before the West. They felt that this was like, looked like really superstitious, right? So they wanted to clean this all up. and. They had a law that in 19, I'm mean 19, in, in um, 1770, 1721 or 22, they had this law that these kinds of icons had to be confiscated yeah. and stored in. Uh, and this becomes very interesting because once these icons are then um, become contested objects, right? Mm -hmm. The discourse, the whole conversation in these letters changes. Mm -hmm changes to issues concerning church authority, government, mm -hmm. who has, you know, who has the right to, uh, to decide, right? Um, and so you have this very interesting, and, and the more you get to 1905, let's say, and closer to the revolution, you find this language of rights in these petitions about these icons. And I just have to read, can I just read one small? Yeah, of course, yeah. This is just so in 1916, right? This letter, so revealing. And this man, this is written by a man. He's complaining that this icon that had been um, actually uh, composed, uh, written by a, um, uh, a very famous elder, Ambrosi, from Optina Pustin, which is a very well known monastery where a lot of intellectuals, you know, would travel to meet with these elders, right? Um, uh, and so uh, the icon became very well known. But it was it was a new iconographic type, and um, you know, in in church regulations at the time, new iconographic types again were very suspicious, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so they were um, even though it was everywhere, right? People just made them and and had them, but you know, the, the church officials at the time were, were were suspicious of them. So this is the quote from the letter. He writes, and don't forget what's going on, 1916. So this is after, this is already the whole coming toward the revolution, you know, the, 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 the whole rights discourse is entering into, the, into society, right? So he writes, the assembly of the faithful, that of the Orthodox Church, okay? So the assembly of the faithful, which means us, the, our community, our parish, right? Um, that is the Orthodox Church has venerated this icon for some time, but the Holy Synod, which is, you know, the, 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 the ruling party there, but the Holy Synod does not pay attention to the Holy Orthodox Church. You're reading this and you're like, what? So he's saying the Synod is not paying attention to the church. Right, right, right. But it, and so he said, but incidentally, after all, the Holy Synod is established and called not for the purpose of, his, of ruining the church and leaving petitions and requests without action, as is their accepted custom, 
Mm-hmm. Holy Synod, in its pride, however, does not want to recognize the faithful in a unified way, but moves against them. But who exists for whom? The Holy Church for the Synod or the Synod for the Holy for the Church? Right. Can you believe this? They, they keep, in other words, the icons keep telling a story in many ways in terms of the reaction. This is it. all over an icon. Yeah, yeah. And it's different from what we normally learn about the icon. Normally we think about the icon, of course we know different schools, right? Right, you think about it visually only. Right, but, but we don't think about, uh, you know, the fact that within local spaces, certain modifications were made. I mean, there's a certain kind of real uh, localness uh, to icons. There's localness, but it's also, as I- We're getting back to your original point about diversity and- uh, and not Right, and when you see an icon, when you see an icon, especially in Russia, I don't know how it is in other Orthodox communities, but in Russia, if you go to Russia and you see a particularly revered icon, it's you. Ha- the first question I always tell my students, you have to ask, what is its story? Yeah, that's yeah. You normally don't ask that see question. See the story. You can't yeah, see the story, but you have in order to understand that icon, you have to know its story. Yeah, normally you don't. Uh, normally that question isn't really asked. So we, could, you and I, can go on and on. I mean, I feel like we are. Right. Uh, we have to go. Right. It's time it, to go. No, no. We have time to. We have to address a few questions actually to make sure that the audience also feels that they're kind of involved. But uh, but before we get to the questions, tell us a little bit, yeah, tell us like when you were studying in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, I mean, what what really stood out or a particular story that ultimately really uh, has stood out for you? Uh, in that Because that's an amazing experience that few people have had to come from the US and to actually go and study within the Soviet Union and study religion, actually, religion, orthodoxy. Well, it was lucky that it was in the theological academy and that right. I had the opportunity because I had, um, I'm sorry, they're mowing the lawn outside. Um, had a, they had a, um, uh, I was invited to participate in a conference that was being held for the millennium, that a series of conferences for the millennium uh, celebration of, of, of orthodoxy in Russia. And I was invited from, you know, by someone I knew to, to participate in that conference and to deliver a paper. And uh, when I was at that conference, I don't think they knew what to, I, I mean, it was all men and there was a few foreign women who were, you know, like um, ordained uh, women pastors yeah. from the medical movement, right? Um, and I don't know what they knew what to do with a graduate student who was Orthodox woman, uh, you know, it was, uh, but they were also, it was amazing, you know, I, yeah. you know, I. I, I, you know, this is a, you know, it's, it's a very interesting point that at that conference, for example, you know, I would just, again, they just treated me so normally. Um, and I think it was because of my, the way I was raised with my father, right? In that whole clergy environment. I was just, you know, I just felt that was sort of fit in, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just sort of plopped down and started asking them a question and, you know, they would answer and we would have this great conversation. And I, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I met at the time uh, uh, the dean of the theological academy in, in Leningrad, uh, mm-hmm. and we started talking, and, and we hit it off. And you know, he said, you know, maybe you should come study here, and just you know, and maybe we can help you get into archives. Uh, and this was my, during graduate school, and I went back to Pelican and I said, you know, maybe this would help me decide what topic to pursue. Uh, and so he said, okay. Um, and I went for a year and a half, and it was precisely, it was before the fall of the Soviet Union, from 1987, 88, beginning of 89, that t- time period. I stayed there for a year and a half, and it was, um, you know, there's so much I could, I could have a whole, uh, there's so much to say, and right. part of it was very difficult um, in terms of, uh, you know, anyone any seminary going to any seminary as you know is difficult it's not for a reason that in at least in russia many of the revolutionaries were former seminarians right mm-hmm. so uh it's it's difficult on the other hand again some of the people i met um were just unbelievable and and the mind you know at that time there were professors there who had sat in the gulags and they were professors yeah, and that's, that's something mm-hmm. it was unbelievable and the dean himself, I just want to give this one example because it just shows. Yeah. Um, he, he and I were at, I don't know, some banquet or something, and we were sitting next to each other and we were just talking and 
Uh, he's a wonderful man. Every time I go back to Russia, I still, you know, try, you know, he's elderly now, but I find him, he's still running a parish and I, we have great conversations. But at that banquet, I remember we were sitting and talking and he says to me, so Vera, have you been to Athos? And I look at him, I said, and he was like, oh, right. And do you realize for that one moment how that made me feel? I felt like I was just a person. You know, he treated me, he asked me had I been to Athos. Right, right. And that meant everything to me. Yeah. Because he was talking to me like, okay, maybe not an equal, obviously. I'm not gonna go that far. But it yeah. was that it, 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 we were so engaged in the conversation that this gender thing, it just, it was irrelevant. Yeah, that's very, that's very inspiring. I mean, that's really- It was so I mean, inspiring. It's a, great story, it's a great story, yeah. And, he's a, and, and that just shows what kind of a person, you see? And I think when you ask about my father, and this is another thing, Telly, when you talk about clergy, you probably shouldn't have me on this show because I could go all over. <laughs> but I just want to say, it's not that the person's a clergy person, it's who the person is. Right, 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 right. Because I was around a lot of clergy and I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I know clergy and I know clergy. Yeah. And that's because of my father. Right. So it's the person and it's all, and that's what my father taught me. It's always the person. Yeah. My father taught me to value the person. Right. He was so into people. He loved people. And person is such an important word for Orthodox theology. So we do have a question about something that we have a few questions, but just one now that just sort of picked up uh, on something you just said recently. Um, and the quote, and the question is on the quote from the 1916, are you making, so I think the thing you just read, are you making a connection between the revolution and the grassroots church veneration of icons asserting themselves, asserting themselves to the synod and this, the synod. No, what I'm showing is that I think what this was about was that the whole, yeah. um, that this whole notion of subordinates. Mm -hmm became such a, a, a um, all prevalent term at the time, yeah. interpreted in different ways. Was it, can I ask, before you go on, I mean, was Sobornos like, so it's a kind of high technical theological term, but was it a felt, uh, was it, uh, first of all, was it a word really known on the ground? Was well, it he used it. I think he yeah. used it in his, yeah in his letter at well, one point. Kind of, I call it sort of trickle down academics. So to sort of trickle down. Right. Yes, it had. By that time it had. And I think that there were these clergy laity conferences and they were filled with this. That but, word. They, yeah. Yeah. but that word was interpreted in different ways. Yeah. Right? Uh, and subordinates could mean different things for different people. But in this case, right, he, mm -hmm. he interpreted as um, really something that it was about you know it's the people the church is is all of us yeah yeah and they looked at this you know this office as really not almost as if not being part of us right that's interesting standing against us but you're part of us right you know the the the, the, the whole dynamic of belonging he right. switched it do you see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, because even, the, I mean, this was sort of on the ground, but even theologically, uh, there was around, you know, a little bit in, within Orthodox theology of the, of the early 20th century, a push to not identify the church with the institutional apparatus, which I think- well, this is the whole point, And this is the contention. How was church, and this was, this was actually what got me into the whole lived religion thing. How was church understood? Right, right. And, and, and uh, yeah, and in the book, I mean, and in so many of your writings, you just see uh, the different kinds of ways on the ground people were sort of right, and right, and and it's very interesting. Right now, I'm writing this article about canon lawyers in Russia before the revolution, and tell you would be interested in knowing this. I don't see the word symphonia anywhere. That is very interesting, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I don't see it. All they talk about is the so my work on religion and politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not going to go there with you now, but we should talk about this sometime because it's. I was so so surprised because these are um, not in the academies. This was um, professors of canon law teaching in the universities. On um, they introduced the, uh, the the subject of canon law in uh, faculties of law at, at the end of the 19th century, mm -hmm. and then they talk about church and state. 
it's not what you would imagine. Yeah. So uh, just a follow up to this too is that um, this, if the story of the people and their experience of religion through the icons is a big part of the revolution, right? So, which is something. Well, no, I don't think that was a part of the revolution. I just think that the icon became a catalyst for okay. other sensitivities and sensibilities that were building. Okay. Right? This and this sense that you know um, we are the church. We are the church. Have you ever thought about or maybe come across or even just kind of, uh, you know, uh, read about parallels with other kinds of revolutionary, like the French Revolution or? Well, yeah, that's, I mean, I haven't, I haven't yet, but it's on my list of things to do. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a thing to do for the future, yeah. So, um, so just a couple of, um, or just a couple of quick ones now. Um, so, um, let's see here. Uh, so, here's another follow-up, the letter from 1916 you read reminds me of some of the points made by Berjaev, right? Is there a relationship here? And am I imagining things? How widely would his ideas have trickled down? No, it was nothing to do with Berjaev. Not, not him particularly, although he's, although he's a major intellectual figure, let's say, within the early 20th century. Right, but what, I'm try what it seems like is that all of these ideas were circulating broadly within society. It right. wasn't anyone influencing because Again, the notion of subordinates was already being used in, 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 uh, in the 1870s already, you could find right. discussions of it. Okay, so we have um, like three minutes and, and there's, there's you get, I'm gonna give you a choice. So I'm gonna give you, so you get to choose. And then I, do you have to give me 30 seconds to make sure I plug the next, our next series. But so uh, we have a question about um, just, what it's like for you to teach in a non-religious institution, secular, you know, in your, your Orthodox Christianity, perhaps maybe there are certain perceptions of, there's always perceptions of just religion and then always perceptions of Christianity and then there's perceptions of Orthodox Christianity. So what maybe that's like, or I know that, you know, obviously you do work for the Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies and, uh, you know, which is interdisciplinary journal uh, in many ways, the way Smith College is an interdisciplinary sort of institution, um, secular. And so I, I don't know, which one do you want to answer? Do you want to try to answer both in one, in terms of what it's like to be at Smith and what it's like for you to, to be a, a co-editor of an interdisciplinary journal in Orthodox Christian Studies, which to some extent is rare. Um, that's, uh, that's a tough one. And because I also wanted to say something about the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale. All right. Well, okay. So you can do that, but you have like a minute because then I have another minute to, uh, I have to have at least 30 seconds. All right. To the next one. So you have, I'm going to keep you to it. So have a minute. Okay. Tell, so tell us about that. Tell us about that then. The Yale. Uh, yeah. 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 And I think we'll talk, maybe some other time we can talk about the journal and, and yeah, we can, we can always talk about the journal and other. And, and uh, I do teach this course on blasphemy, which I love. And I did want to talk about that, but um, we'll talk about that another time. I just wanted, to, I did want to say, um, just because I just got through with a year there at the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale, uh, and I and I was a fellow, um, and I had be, I began researching a new topic, uh, and I was a visiting professor and taught a course on uh, the politics and culture of Russian sacred art and on the icon, right? Um, and this, this in, um, it's, it's just one of these, again, if you're talking about ac women in academics, right? Um, mm -hmm. One of these uh, very unique places uh, that is, I think, li very little known. And, you know, its vision is, is really uh, very broad, even though it focuses primarily on Christian sacred music. I found it to be uh, extremely um, interdisciplinary. And it works closely with Yale Divinity School, the Yale School of Music, and various departments. Uh, and we had a cohort of eight fellows, each of which uh, had a very different topic on different parts of the world, different religious traditions, and we worked together for a year. And it's this kind of interdisciplinarity, I think, that helps Orthodox academics both um, uh, have others learn about their you know, tradition and so forth. And also learning about other traditions helps you to understand and work with your own. And I was fortunate at this project, uh, at this time to work on this new project that has to do with cultural trauma uh, and the trans uh, generational, um, the transmission of it transgenerationally and the way it affects large group consciousness, right? Uh, and my project has to do with how Orthodox believers in Russia are reckoning with the legacy 
of the Soviet period and the trauma of the Soviet project of the Gulag past. Um, uh, and in particular, I'm focusing on liturgy as a mode of immortalizing memory and the domain in which this reckoning is taking place. And it's a very complex topic because it has to do with, um, you know, images associated, you know, how they're processing this violence and, and what they're trying to memorialize and, you know, perpetuate through the generations, right? What, are, how is this memory right. formulated and being passed down to the next generation? So I have a lot to say about it, but it, it was in this Yale School of Sacred Music, I really... Uh, there's been or other Orthodox scholars that were there at the time with me, uh, and it's it's an amazing place. So but we're going to have to have a very so grateful to them. I'm just so grateful to them and to Martin Jean, its director, that right. I. Just and there's another Orthodox scholar there, isn't Mark Rushin there? Is yes, there? he is, and he was my colleague there studying. You've been for public orthodoxy, but you haven't yet. I don't know when you're going to write for public orthodoxy, but one of these. I days. did write for public orthodoxy. Yeah. Right. And it was too long. I wrote about deaconesses. Oh. <laughs> but you know, I don't write just two pages. Well, we have to cut it short. We have to cut it short on public orthodoxy. We have to cut it short here, too. But So we're going to have to have a Vera Shevzov part two, because we can go on and on and talk about many other interesting things, especially, well, maybe, uh, you know, when we have you back, we'll, we'll, you'll have, you know, you'll be able to tell us a little bit more about the project, which is really uh, uh, important and interesting and, and really understudied. I mean, I know you work with uh, with uh, Katya Tolstaya, uh, who's also uh, thinking about, you know, there, there's a, a literature, for example, post-Holocaust thought, but there's also, she's trying to think about post-Gulag in many ways. I mean, what that's about and, 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 there, and this is the, mo the, the a lot of the scholarship is taking place in Russia now, I have to say. Right, too. right. So there's a lot. Russia, that's Russia is booming. So you always seem to be somehow at the cutting edge of where things are heading, which is kind of very important. And so, uh, and before I thank you, let me just uh, thank uh, our participants. Thank you so much for following and for being part of this conversation and for your questions. Um, and uh, in two weeks, we'll have Maurice Tadros, uh, right, who's an expert on sort of Coptic Christianity and, and the Coptic community, both in diaspora and within Egypt, and uh, it will be a wonderful conversation. She's also part of our human rights project that I that I mentioned. So that will be in two weeks. I don't think we set a time yet, so we're not sure if we're going to have a happy hour or not. But uh, uh, we'll we'll please. I'll look be out. there. Okay, please look out. Please look for an email with your Vera with your Shevzov vodka. I think you'll be there with. But um, so um, please look for an email for that for the link, for the registration, for all that. But it's definitely going to be on Wednesday, July 22nd. And my colleague, George Mikopoulos, will uh, be the interviewer. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, you know, again, we could stay on, uh, you know, on and on and on and talk about, but we'll have you back. We'll have you back and try to address some of these things, especially to ask you a little bit more about the current research that you're doing is really interesting. Thank you, Vera. And so many questions that I have for you, but okay. Yeah, all right. Well, maybe we'll switch it around one of these days. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm going to now end the meeting and uh, the best to all of you and uh, happy July. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.